This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, Episode 9, where we'll discuss managing Azure Virtual Machines and listener questions. Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, the only place to stay up to date on everything going on in the Microsoft Cloud world, including Windows Azure, Office 365, SharePoint, Exchange, Link, and related technologies. Just the information, no marketing, no BS. I'm Chris Johnson. And I'm Andrew Connell. And we're just two dudes telling you how we see it. Hey, AC, so what have you been up to? Uh, this past week uh, has been quite busy. I know we've released a couple, a lot more shows recently, but um, I'm plugging away at the uh, my, my advanced workflow class I'm doing for Pluralsight. Um, was going to make a lot more progress on it this week until I walked out earlier this week and saw uh, right outside my house, two houses being built, um, had a bunch of lumber dropped off in cranes. And so now all I have in the background is nail guns and cranes <laughs> and air brakes popping. Uh but then it's going to be your life for a little, uh, for a few months then. Yeah. Well, usually that'll just last for just a couple, maybe like two weeks and then it should kind of die down. They'll be doing a lot more work inside and things should calm down, but, um, all the sawing and stuff will die down. So I'm trying to get everything prepared so I can record as much as I can in the little lull that we'll have. But, um, I guess the other two things, uh, next week I'll be at the, uh, SP live 360 conference in Orlando. All right. Yeah. With a bunch of people. So it'd be a, it's a good little, good little show. Um, I've done it a couple of times, so it'll be, be fun. And, uh, I guess the other really big thing is that, you know, in the past we've touched on a few on this SaaS product that I said that I was working on. And, um, by the time this podcast goes live, everyone will have uh, seen, or at least hopefully we'll have seen in our blogs that, uh, you and I actually have been collaborating on it. We came up with a new product called uh, Software as a Service called Curb, which uh, will which we announced this week, and we'll uh, uh, we'll kind of go into a little bit later, I guess. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds cool. We can talk a bit about it. Cool. How about you? What have you been up to this past week? Oh, I've been uh, I've been catching up on a whole bunch of work um, and things that kind of got put off while uh, while we were away speaking at uh, SharePoint Intersections and uh, SharePoint uh, SharePoint Saturday Chicago and things. So this week has been manic, just uh, catching up on a whole lot of administrivia and and uh, the the uh, the day to day of running a small business. So um, yeah, it's, I've basically been playing catch up for the last week. I finally feel like I'm getting on top of it, just in time for us to go to the Formula One this weekend. There you go. So uh, so that's good. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and, you know, we're hoping to record a show while we're off, uh, in Austin, uh, you know, a ship, you know, a, a podcast episode. So, um, so that will be interesting to see if we pull off, <laughs> but yeah, it's, a, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to a bit of, uh, the, the sweet, sweet smell of, of, uh, of a one jet fuel and of all the helicopters landing, dropping people off and, uh, and, uh, and the cars. Yeah, it's going to be I'm I guess I could say that I'm looking forward to the splitting headache that we'll have from uh that I'll have from the the wine of the of those massive powerful engines. So it's <laughs> it's a lot yeah, of the fun. sweet the sweet smell of of uh clutch dust and brake dust is pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so why don't we move on to uh some news and notes? So there's been a little bit going on in the in the cloud universe as always. So uh, why don't we touch on a few things that have happened recently and um, and kick off with some news? Sure. So the uh, the first one uh, that I've seen is that uh, in the Azure space uh, we've got something called HD Insight. And uh, recently Microsoft announced the Azure team announced that the HD Insight product has now reached general availability, so customers can go take advantage of this. Uh, if you're not familiar with what HD Insight is. Um, there's there's something there's a technology called Hadoop, uh, which is basically around big data, and it's something that that came about uh, really out of the Yahoo Labs, um, but a lot of companies are using it now. I know that um, Facebook uses it uh, for a lot of their stuff. I believe Twitter uses it, Google uses it. Um, in fact, uh, kind of going along with recent events, I know that there was a lot of news on the technical side that. Um, this is one of the things that the NSA uses, um, the um, National Security Agency uh, uses to uh, slice and dice and analyze a lot, of, a lot of the data that they're using for a lot of the surveillance stuff. And snooping on the tubes, <laughs> huh? snooping on the tubes. 
And one of the things, uh, so what Microsoft did is that they implemented uh, the Hadoop uh, on the uh, the Azure stack, and their product that they have, that they their implementation of it, they call it as HD Insight. So um, the idea, I guess, behind Hadoop is that. You know, instead of a lot of us are used to working with databases, um, but databases are tied to specific servers or clusters. And the idea of Hadoop is to take lots and lots of data, massive and massive amounts of data and be able to spread it across a massive farm or a series of servers or even an entire data center um, and have all of that kind of managed all from one central kind of orchestrator cluster and having all the hardware underneath it really be transparent. So if, you know, a couple of nodes die off, uh, the data isn't lost. It's just kind of a, no, we want to add some stuff back. So, you know, think about it. I guess one way I like to think about it is think about it almost like uh, raid five, but for just for data, don't think raid five for a specific server. So if one drive fails, you're okay. Um, think about it as like RAID 5 kind of a setup for an entire kind of logical data structure. So they've reached now HD Insight, now general availability, and it's available for uh, out of preview for customers to use in uh, production scenarios. Nice, nice. That sounds, uh, that sounds really interesting. Um, good, uh, good for big number crunching. So um, also in other news in Azure, um, this week or this past week, uh, saw the general availability of RMS, which is Microsoft's rights management server. And um, in the past, this is this is a product that's not well known, I would say, in, in general, um, but has been around for quite some time now. And it used to be a service or a service, uh, sorry, a server that you'd you know deploy in an organization. And it would let um, it would let people do things like apply uh, security policies um, to sensitive documents or things like email or Word docs and things like that. And so say I was sending you an email and then I'd, you know, I'd write the email. I could I could secure it by clicking a button in the ribbon in Outlook and say, I, I don't want to let people uh, forward this or uh, or do anything like that I'd, or take screenshots and all that sort of stuff. And so then when the email gets sent, the other guy opens it up um, and then they're, they're bound by those policies that are applied um, and they can't send it out of the organization, that sort of thing. So uh, it was basically about, you know, securing those documents and emails and so forth. And now it's available uh, in Azure. So the reason this is interesting is because it makes it a lot easier to deploy. So one of the problems in the past with RMS is it took a whole bunch of work to get it deployed inside an organization um, and get it deployed in such a state that it could be used with outside organizations as well. And so now it's available in Azure. It lets you sort of uh, share those sensitive documents and emails um, in a much more secure manner, uh, both inside your organization and out. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of like, you know how when people have problems sharing documents with people outside the organization, they usually do something like stick it in Dropbox or stick it in SkyDrive or put it up on, you know, Mega or something like that. I don't know, all these external services. And it terrifies management in these organizations that sensitive material is stepping outside the organization. And, uh, if you use a tool like this, then it makes it much more much easier to share this stuff with with external parties and with internal people and know that that data is going to stay safe with corporate governance too uh, you, you put that stuff in azure or sorry you put that stuff in uh, dropbox you put that stuff in like in skydrive or whatever and that just goes right outside the realm of your company so it's it's a you lose all the governance that you have but if you have something like rms you know then you can still keep that inside the company and still have some kind of uh, governance around that content yeah, definitely. And it's from a user's perspective, it's really easy. You just click a button in the ribbon and a little dialogue pops up and says, you know, who do you want to share it with? What permissions do you want to let them have? Things like, you know, can they print it, for example, or can they, you know, view it, that sort of stuff, right? Um, and when the content expires, so you could say, hey, I, you know, I don't want them to be able to open this document after the end of the month or something along those lines. Um and then there's obviously the whole backend infrastructure that gets deployed in Azure that helps do this. Um, and then there's also a series of um, mobile apps that help um, be able to read these things on mobile devices. 
Um, and I believe they've got it for um, iOS and Windows Phone. I'm not sure about Android just yet, but um, that may very well be the case as well. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so this just makes it a whole bunch easier to uh, to deploy, and and you can and do it in Azure now, which is nice. Very cool. I know uh, one other bit of uh, news. I was I wanted to talk more about this in this episode, but I think it's probably a little bit um, better if we kind of punt this for another show or for like, probably the next show. Is that uh, this week? Well, the week that we're recording this, um, it's the week of November eleventh, and uh, Amazon or AWS is having their big uh, event conference in Las Vegas this week, and so. Um, I've seen a, a, a little bit of news come out about it. Some new things that they're offering, that they're that they're adding, and uh, uh, new support that they're adding, features they're adding to to the Amazon cloud, to the AWS. Um, but uh, I think that it's a little premature to talk about. Let's. I was going to wait until the next episode. That will. I'll take a few minutes and I'll explain some of the things that they've done uh, and that they're announcing at their big uh, annual conference. Um, once we have, yeah, that'd be with the whole. Sh- that'd be interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah, let's let's go through it again in another episode. Look at all their big announcements, and then uh, and then see how it stacks up to uh, to some of the Microsoft cloud offerings. Cool. Sounds good. So this episode, we're going to talk about um, we're going to take some listener questions, but we're also going to talk about um, managing Azure virtual machines. So why don't we get into that? And uh, I think why don't we you know to kick things off? Why don't we take a listener question? I think we've got one lined up here. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll see what Eric Shops has to say, and then we'll get into it. How do you build a development environment for Windows apps, Office apps, SharePoint apps in Azure for the least amount of cost? Excellent. So um, thanks, Eric, for sending in your question. Um, and uh, if, for anybody listening, you can go onto MicrosoftCloudShow.com forward slash questions to submit your own one if you if you want um, and there's details at the end of the pod show uh, episode on how to do that but back to Eric's question so how do you build a dev environment in Azure for the lowest cost um, have you got any thoughts on this to kick it off AC uh, yeah I got a few things just to, that I'll touch on here so uh, first of all um, if you are an MSDN subscriber uh, one of the nice things that we have is that Microsoft has set up um, I guess a few months ago, we we all had uh, special kind of allocations that we could use for uh, different metrics or different kind of usage that we could have inside of our uh, inside of uh, Azure that would be credited towards our bill. But they they really simplified stuff a couple months ago or a month or so ago. Uh, where now we just if you're an MSDN subscriber, then you get either 150 or 200 dollars uh, that are allocated towards your bill as like credits that you just kind of go against and then. Um, it will you can have your account by default just stop uh, at your Azure account will effectively just stop once you reach that that credit limit um, or you're going to um, you can put in a credit card and let it start billing you on an a la carte uh, way. So um, that's one with the MSDM subscription. Um, and plus, you'll have access to you know SharePoint and Windows and everything uh, from your MSDN sub so you can build out your your environment. So I would still think that you know, Azure is going to give you or an MSDN sub is going to give you, save you the most cost. Um, some of the other things too, though, uh, is that, you know, with the Azure VMs, um, I'm really starting to like this option instead of having to lug around a big, you know, powerful laptop and using Azure for my development environments or for when I'm presenting. Um, one of the things you want to keep in mind though, is that uh, as far as the cost goes for the Azure VMs, um, the way it works is you effectively have three different uh, cost buckets that you're going to have to deal with. Um, one that you're going to have, uh, I think two of them are really the, the minor ones. One of them is going to be around the storage cost for having your your virtual hard disk in a Azure uh, blob storage. Um, you know, you're going to have a VM or multiple VMs. And you're going to have anywhere I, from what I've seen anywhere from like really 40 gigs to really probably around the 100 to 150 gigs uh, for what your your SharePoint farm is going to look like. If you just have one, then you're looking at probably 50 to 60 gigs. Um, but that is relatively cheap as far as um, the cost is concerned. So you're always going to have that cost. Um, the other one you're going to have is uh, a cost associated with the amount of data that comes out of the VM. Um, that too is relative for a developer environment. That's relatively cheap. So that's yeah. for my, for my purposes, I completely ignore those two costs. I mean, that's just, it's, it's less than $10 or so a month, maybe even less than $5. Um, 
the one where you're really going to have a lot of where the cost comes into play is the compute um, cycle. So you're paying for a per minute. And I think you get a grace period of like 15 minutes, but you have a per minute cost that you're going to pay uh, for the VMs when they're running. So if you shut the VMs down, then you don't have the compute cost. You just have that storage cost of the VHDs um, or VHDX. If you have the VMs running, then you are going to have that compute cost. So you really want to have something, uh, really want to pay attention to, to making sure that your VMs are only running when you're using them. There's, you know, people have set up PowerShell scripts. People have set up um, uh, screensavers inside of the VM so that if, if the VM isn't being used over the course of 30 minutes or an hour, then uh, their screensaver kicks in, runs a PowerShell script, and it shuts the VM down automatically for them. Um, so stuff like that. So there's a couple different things that are, that are available to you. And then, you know, obviously there's a, we have a whole vested interest in another option that we'll talk about towards the end of the show. So yeah. What, yeah. What I about think that, you? that's, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, um, Azure is ultra flexible, right. Um, but with great power comes great responsibility as well. And, um, and so it's very easy to obviously spin up virtual machines, for example, like a large virtual machine in Azure, which um, is has got four um, four procs assigned to it and seven gig of RAM, is about thirty six cents US per hour, um, uh, which is about two hundred and sixty seven bucks a month if you leave it running full time twenty four by seven, and. At 36, bucks, 36 cents an hour, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it obviously quickly adds up, right? So this is what this is what people have been, you know, talking about of Azure being a costly way to run your dev environment is, you know, at 267 bucks a month, it doesn't stack up that well against going and buying some on-prem hardware or or doing something else like that. Um but I've also heard from other developers that if you don't run your environments full time and if you only run them for the hours that you're actually needing them and you have a really easy way to shut them down and start them up, then um, then it does become a lot more cost effective because you're really only you know, running it for, say, a third of a month as opposed to, or a quarter of a month as opposed to a full month um, if you're only running it for your productive time. So, you know, we'll talk about what we've been working on in a little bit, but I think when most people look at Azure, and they dismiss it because of the cost. They dismiss it because of what the costs look like trying to run it 24-7 for the whole month as opposed to just the time that they need it. And, um, you know, they've got reasons for, for that. It's it's often hard to teach a development team or, or ask people to remember to shut stuff down. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, you know, these are all retail prices. And if you're seriously investing in building stuff in Azure, um, both if you run a development team or you have a or a team of developers um, or, or if you're just on your own there are there are more there are smarter ways to buy Azure than paying full retail on the website and you obviously hinted at one with the free credits you get through your MSDN subscription 150 or 200 dollars that goes quite a long way um, if you manage it carefully the other thing is you can buy upfront commitments in Azure. So you can pay, you can do what, rather than doing the pay as you go plan, which is literally 36 cents per hour, you can buy um, a sort of a six month commitment and you say, I want to buy this much compute for six months. And so you commit to paying that much, but you get like a 20, it depends on what you're buying, but you get roughly anywhere from 20 to 25% um a discount off full off full retail pricing in Azure. And so if you're saying, hey, I'm gonna have this, I'm gonna be doing these things in Azure for this long, um, and you commit to it, you can you can get you know 20% off or whatever it happens to be. That that discount varies per service, but it's roughly uh it's a decent discount. And then the third thing is um if you're in a larger organization and you're going uh, you're going fully committed to this. You can get even deeper levels of discounts by um, buying Azure through an enterprise agreement with Microsoft. So um, that is obviously a much bigger commitment, um, but it, and it's really only applicable for larger organizations. Um, but it means that you get you, know, you get even more off off uh, full retail as well. Yeah, you, you mentioned the the cost piece about 
you know, running it for the entire month or, or, you know, running it only when you really need it. I mean, I think, it, you know, let's just give, give people a bit of an example here. Let's say, you know, with a, a typical SharePoint, you know, web server, if you want to go have a, a typical SharePoint web server, um, you've got a couple different options for the different VMs that you can choose from the A the A5 and the A6, I think are the most common one. So the, the A5 is a two core, uh, machine with 14 gigs of RAM uh, and the A6 is a four core machine with 28 gigs of RAM. So I think, you know, from a development point of view, you could get by with the A5, but let's just, uh, we'll look at like, just say the A, we'll just use the A5 as for example, um, A6 would just be twice as much. Um, if you ran that VM just for your SharePoint VM, and this doesn't include, you know, if you had a domain controller and a SQL server and stuff, you know, you're looking at about $278 a month. If you left it running 24, seven, uh, three, you know, the entire month. Um, but if you take into account that, let's say you're, you're doing SharePoint work a hundred percent of your billable time, which, you know, nobody does, you know, work a hundred percent of their billable time anyway. It's always, yeah. you know, you can shut it off at different times, but let's just, you know, play conservative and say that you're going to be using this VM during business hours. So let's say that's, you know, eight to 5 PM or nine to six, whatever. Um, if you shut off the VM at night and on the weekends, you would save fifty one percent of the cost, and so your cost would really be closer to one hundred ninety eight instead of two hundred and ninety eight dollars um, a month. So yeah, you you don't need to have these VMs running all the time. Um, I, in fact, I, I saw this really good blog post the other day about how someone was talking about how flexible and how fanta- how powerful um, Azure is to where you know they had a requirement to where they needed to do. Um, they need to do some really complex uh, calculations in SQL and they needed a lot of processing power and a lot of memory. And so what they did is they spun up the biggest Azure VM, which is an eight core 56 gig uh, machine, which is roughly Ooh, about, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's roughly about a <laughs> dollar 60, uh, about a dollar 60 an hour um, or a little bit more than that. And what they did is, you know, this VM, if you ran it the entire month, I mean, you're looking at a, you know, $1,200 bill or, or a huge bill, but this guy fired up this VM. He actually fired up two of them. He loaded in all of his data um, into the VM, which took about an hour or two. And then he had Azure, just, he had the SQL, installed SQL inside the VM and had to just tear through all this data, doing a ton of analytics and spitting out a ton of reports. It took about four or five hours. And then he just threw the VMs away. And if yeah. you, you think about the flexibility of being able to have access to those, you know, that, 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 that kind of hardware to do that short term kind of burst of work. And then just dispose of it. I mean, it's just I think that that's what that's the part where I think a lot of people are are missing out on this. They're thinking, God, if I build these VMs that are running all the time, it's going to be so expensive. But yeah, you're, yeah, you're not running it all the time. You don't need to. You just need it when you're doing the work. I think also from along that same sort of avenue of thought around being able to spin stuff up and drop it down really quick. Um, you know, I work at a I work in a uh, in a systems integrator, right? So we 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 have we're a dev shop and we build lots of different pieces of software for lots of different people, and often we'll get um, projects where we need to spin up new things really quick, and we need to get a new developer up and running really fast, um, and we sort of use a mixture of Azure VMs for that and on-prem Hyper-V servers, and we always come across this problem, like always at the worst possible moment. Like our Hyper V's full of our Hyper V servers are all full of virtual virtual machines running. It's really pain. It's a pain to manage. Like um, when to get rid of them. You've got to put more memory in the machines. You've got to put more. They always seem to be running out of disk space. All that sort of stuff. Whereas as you never come across those those boundaries, you 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 can keep provisioning virtual machines. And also, if you automate it really well, like with PowerShell or what have you, you can spin them up and and um. And sort of the provisioning process of putting everything in there is nice and quick. And so you can get a developer spun up really fast. In fact, you know, for service-based organizations like uh, like the one I work at, it's um, it's really, um, it's a very costly problem when you've got a developer that's blocked on something. So if you've got a dev that's sitting there blocked, waiting for a virtual machine to be provisioned by your IT team for one or two hours, those are... you. Just burn hundred dollar bills in front of my face. Right? It's, <laughs> it is that painful watching a project go. You know, with you know, you've got people 
that need want to be productive on a project but can't because they're waiting around for these infrastructure uh, resources to be provisioned and so forth. And so, yeah, being able to spin stuff up in Azure really fast also is kind of has these intangible benefits of um, of more productivity for people because they're not waiting around as long. Yeah, it's burning hundred dollar bills in front of our face. That reminds me of a particular evening in Las Vegas uh, when we were in Vegas for <laughs> the conference a couple of weeks ago. But oh god, don't remind me. Yeah, we're not gonna. I don't need to. I don't. I don't care to share any personal stories here. <laughs> right. Thankfully, my wife so, doesn't Eric, listen to the show, so I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, no hard. <laughs> um. So, in terms of running a dev environment in Azure for the lowest cost, so we talked a little bit about provisioning stuff and the flexibility that Azure offers. And we've talked a little bit about helping to um, contain your Azure costs by only running it when you need your dev environments. But also what about um, what about as a as a, from a developer perspective, as you as a developer, what's it like to work with these things? Because a lot of one of the other complaints I get is, hey, with Hyper V on my 32 gig laptop that only, you know, a very select few of us have uh, one of me, one of them not being me. Um, you know, people say, "Oh, well, you know, RDPing into a machine is a pain, and it's not quite as good because I can't." You know, it's all local and and all that sort of stuff. So, what are some of those issues that you've come across, and and uh, how do you address those? I think the 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 challenge. I've been living in the SharePoint space now for ten years, and for the. In- entire 10 years, we've had to work within virtual machines. We had that, you know, one or two little forays where we could run inside um, on on a Windows uh, client-based operating system. But for the most part, we've been running inside of virtual machines. And I mean, me personally, it's, I'm, as someone who travels a good bit for work, I've just gotten to be so tired of lugging around this 32 gig laptop. I mean, it's a great machine. I absolutely love it, but it's really just a very uh, short, um, desktop the way I see it. Um, I mean, it just, it's a lot of extra weight. It's a pain to get everything all set up and stuff. The battery life is, is never, is never spectacular. So, um, I really, Plus you look like a, you look like a dork on the plane trying to open that thing in your seat. Right. And then somebody reclines the seat in front of you and you're, you kind of got this thing that's the size of a small mini bus that's sort of half open and half closed. And you're trying to tap away on it and things. It's a pain to carry around. It really is. It really is. I mean, I, I've gotten to the point where I don't even pull it out on the plane anymore. And, um, I find that what I, uh, what I've, I've, when I've started moving more of my VMs into Azure and doing more of my stuff, I still do everything hyper V and when I'm local, when I'm, when I'm at home. Um, but I've started trying to do a little bit more of working inside of Azure, um, from, a, a more of an ultra book kind of a scenario. So I, I personally have a MacBook air, um, but you know, look, using something like the Lenovo carbon or any of the other, um, ultra books that are out there, there's so much more lightweight. You don't need all of that extra power, uh, with you. You want to, you, I want more of the portability. I want more of the flexibility. And frankly, I like the more the reliability of having my VMs running in the cloud, connecting via RDP is not a big deal. The way I see it, I'm already doing that. So the only, the yeah. only negative to it, and and I don't and I certainly am not minimizing this, but the only negative to this is that when when you're at an event, when you're at a like a SharePoint Saturday is not a big deal. When I'm at a um, at a smaller conference, generally it's not that big of a deal. But when you're at a big conference, it is a big deal, and that's the internet availability, the the, band, the broadband availability. Um, for the most part, it, it conference internet just sucks, and there's and it's just because there's that many people trying to get through the same pipe. It's hard to, for companies to go through and to stand that up, so uh, or for events to stand that up. Um, so you have to have you have to have a reliable internet connection. That's going to be the last mile problem um, if you go in this direction. Uh, for me, I have one of those little jetpacks or MiFi's or one of the little three G, four G LTE devices that I can have my own internet in my pocket. Um, yeah, as a backup plan, right? Yeah, as a backup plan. Um, mm. But then the other thing, too, is what I found uh, it, when I'm doing presentations, what I found actually in the last three or four months is that if I have a recording of my demo working inside of SharePoint, but you know if I'm doing stuff on the developer side, I still pop open and can kind of poke around using uh, Visual Studio um, locally on my Ultrabook then the, the attendees are just fine with it. So I don't, yeah. I, I'm not finding it to be as much of a barrier as it was before. The biggest thing that I'm concerned about is leaving my VMs running uh, when I walk off stage or whatever and having to get a connection again and shut this down, which again, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But. yeah. 
Well, there's a couple of things I've learned uh, doing this as well that um, I think would be valuable for other folks. And, um, you know, people that have, uh, you know, RDP is one one example of things people necessarily don't like. It used to be a lot more painful when RDP didn't have like multi-mon support and all that sort of stuff. And now it's a whole bunch better. But um, uh, so internet connectivity is obviously the first one of the one of the tips that one of the tricks that I do is um, I use what's called a a point to site VPN with Azure, and so what I do is I end up having my local laptop with my Visual Studio and tools and so forth on it, and then I've got the Azure VMs, and usually it's you know one or more uh, machines in the cloud um, that are running you know SharePoint and maybe a DC in a in a SQL box or something like that. Um, and you can create what's called a point to site VPN between your laptop and your Azure uh, infrastructure. And so it's kind of like VPNing into an organization like you would into your work place of work or something like that. You, you know, in Windows, you say, you know, initiate VPN and, and it creates this virtual private network between your machine and your cloud machines. And um, I find this, although it kind of you can get into your machines using RDP just without doing this in, in Azure. But I find like if by adding the point to site thing, it means that you can use your, you can open up Internet Explorer or Chrome or whatever you happen to use and hit your SharePoint sites directly without having to go through RDP. You can use Visual Studio on your box um, and, you know, be writing code and uh, deploying into cloud VMs. Um, that sort of thing, without necessarily having to RDP. So sometimes, if you've got a little bit of RDP lag, that can really you know piss you off as a developer. Um, and so, there's by using a point to site VPN, you're starting to get around some of those things. Um, it's, it makes it a little less painful. Well, you should you should have a blog post about that, and we should reference that because that's that's something that I would I love to try out and use in my environment. Well, funnily enough, I do have a blog post about oh, that. Oh, there you go. So I will uh, I will I will link to that in the show notes and. Um, it's a little bit funky to get set up. I got to tell you, like it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky to uh, to get your point to site VPN um, up and running. But um, once you do, you you just get this little exe and you run it on each of the uh, executable. For those who can't understand my funny language, <laughs> um, and you just run it on your laptop and it installs a little VPN uh, thing, and then you you know double tap it, and boom, you're straight into your. Uh, into your thing, into your cloud environment, and it's all done with certs and that sort of stuff. So it's it's uh, it's great. Works really well. Very cool. Very cool. I guess in the so other, we'll link off. Yeah. To that. So we we'll, we'll grab the post. We'll put that in the uh, in the show notes. And I guess the other one we can put in the show notes too for building out your environment is uh, Azure has these uh, these scripts um, that you can go grab to build out an environment for you using PowerShell uh, in a very automated yeah. way. So yeah, and for SharePoint uh, developers listening to this, um, there's also specifically some SharePoint scripts that help you build a farm, um, a sort of a development farm and directly in Azure as well. Um, so although you can build any sort of machine, um, there are also some, uh, those additional scripts for SharePoint devs mm. to, to help do that as well. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. That's, uh, I also talk about that in that same blog post. So, um, we'll link to that and, uh, you go take a, take a read of that. Very cool. So I guess we had an, another question um, uh, that we wanted to address here uh, by Jeremy Thake. He asked about guid uh, guidance and development, proof of concept, Azure VMs. Uh, basically, how do we deal with starting and stopping them, snapshots, tools, resources uh, that, we, that we use? And I think that we covered a lot of that in Eric's uh, question uh, about you know, how we can stop them. Um, how we can automate that stuff uh, using like screen using a, the screensaver and having timeouts uh, and stuff. I'll, I will, we can reference a, a post a blog post that someone has show, demonstrating how to go about doing that uh, with a screensaver. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things he touches on there is snapshots, and that's a big point of difference between Azure and Hyper-V. Is um, you know Hyper-V gives you the ability to be running a virtual machine and then and then say, I want to take a snapshot of it. And if it's not running, it'll take a snapshot of the disks at that point. And then if it is running, it'll take a snapshot of the disks and of the currently running memory as well, right? So uh, you can effectively take a sort of a snapshot of a point in time 
of that virtual machine. And, uh, and it's very handy because you can roll back to these different snapshots. But in Azure, uh, they don't have this capability right now. So you can't take a snapshot of a currently running virtual machine. You, um, it won't take a, you know, there is no snapshot option and it won't take a snapshot of uh, the currently running, you know, machine with the memory state and the disks. The sort of the only, the closest thing in Azure right now is shutting a virtual machine down and taking a snapshot of the drives. Uh, and you can do that. You can take a copy of those drives and save them off into blob storage um, and then go download them if you want. Um, but you don't have that capability of taking an in-memory, a running state virtual machine. And it is a bit, it is a bit of a drawback. So that's, um, uh, that's a little bit painful to get used to. But like I said, you can take snapshots of the disks um, and then you can, you know, effectively roll back by unattaching a disk and reattaching your old disk and firing the machine back up. Yeah, so it's kind of like manual snapshots is what you're doing. Right, right. So it's uh, it's not quite as straightforward as it is in Hyper-V on-prem, um, and it's not quite as handy, but um, it's possible to get part of the way there. Who knows? Maybe we'll see... Maybe we'll see uh, running machine snapshots in Azure coming at some point. I don't know. I'd, That'd be cool. I'd be surprised if we don't see that. I mean, these guys are there with the, amount, the updates coming out is crazy. So, um. yeah, yeah. The other thing to note is, you know, in Hyper V, when you take a snapshot, it's taking a it's taking a diff of your disks, a differential. So each time you take a snapshot, it's only take like the cost of that snapshot in terms of disk space is only the difference of the changes that you've made to the disk. Whereas in Hyper-V, if you take a snapshot of, sorry, in Azure, if you take a snapshot of a hard drive, you're taking an entire copy of that drive. So if you've got a 40 gig disk and you take a copy of it, you've got another 40 gig to deal with, not, you know, 200 meg or something, whatever the, whatever the differential was. Okay, so why don't we uh, why don't we take another another question? We got we got sent a question um, from one of our listeners. Uh, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, Mario, but Mario Fulan. 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 Okay, yep. excellent. So his question is: I get asked this a lot. People want to know the best way to use Azure for doing dev test in Azure. Uh, I've been doing this for a while and I've had some experiences with leaving my VMs in active and running up a monthly bill. Still a great option, but need to turn off VMs when not in use. For corporations, there is no way to pull the MSDN hours and they don't want to spend money on Azure hours. Isn't it better for corporations just to buy hours so they can have multiple users share VMs and be more productive? What do you think? So what are your thoughts on this, AC? This probably leads pretty well into uh, into a topic we want to cover off in this uh, in this uh, episode about uh, about this uh, SaaS product. Yeah, I I think it does. I mean, I think that you know we we've seen. I see this as a need that I mean, I know that I personally have needed. I know you and I have talked about it. You you say that it would be something that would be helpful for you, it'd be helpful for the company that you work with. I mean, I've talked to countless companies that would be interested in this. Um, so what what you and I did. Is we came up with the idea. We we came up with this, of a SaaS offering. We call it Curb K E R R B, which is a um, uh, you came up with a great name because it's a it's a play off the the phrase Curb Your Spend, um, and the idea is is that essentially you can think of it almost as like insurance. Um, for what it does is that for a monthly subscription, uh, you're going to be able to add your VMs to your account that we're going to uh, at our product or our service. And what it will do is it will monitor your VMs to see if they're running. And based on schedules that you define and policies that you define, we will automatically shut down your VMs for you so that if you leave, you know, at the end of the day and you forget to shut your VM off, if it's, if it's inside of a specific window, we'll shut the VM down on you. Um, now we're not going to, you know, we, the nice thing is that we, we are going to have some stuff in there where you'll be notified and you'll get like a little grace period and say, there'll be things like, you know, Hey, we're going to shut your VM down in the next 20 minutes. Uh, unless you respond to this email or you respond to this, this SMS message to say, you know, no, 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 I'm actually working on it. Um, but it will effectively make sure that it'll, it'll give companies a bit of assurance so that they don't have to remember, um, or it'll, it'll avoid the costly mistakes of developers accidentally leaving the VMs running uh, overnight or over yeah. the weekends. You know, it, 
it goes back to that point I made earlier about Azure might not necessarily stack up from a cost perspective if you have a set of VMs that you leave running 24-7 all month, right? But with Curb, the idea is that you could maybe halve that bill or quarter that bill by only leaving the VMs running when you need them. And, you know, so obviously weekends might be a good option. If you don't work the weekends, we'd shut them down. If you leave work at 6 p.m. or 5.30 p.m., we'll shut them down at that time. And then, and then uh, you know, you only have them on during working hours during the week uh, or even less. Maybe you're working on a project on Monday, Tuesdays, but you don't use them on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Everybody has the best intentions and say, I'm going to leave. Uh, yes, I'm going to be a good Azure citizen and turn off my dev VMs when I'm not using them. But chances are you forget. And unless you have some sort of automated way to do that, then uh, you're going to rack up uh, cloud bills. And Curb is designed to uh, to help you uh, not hit one of those situations. You know, we've we've got I, I've you know developers that, uh, that work for me, and uh, in our organization, we have lots and lots of developers, and they are really super super smart people. But if there's one thing developers are not good at, it's when they're leaving work at the end of the day and they're thinking about a problem that they're trying to so- solve in code, and they're deep in thought. They're very they've got a very myopic view. Is that the right word? Very myopic, very focused view on, on, on what they're trying to solve, and they forget to go turn off their development VMs, or um, you know, it's not malicious, right? It's just an accident, but they can be very costly accidents. So we've had situations where devs have been running quite large VMs and have racked up a couple of thousand bucks in a month, uh, which is obviously very painful. <laughs> I think, I mean, we've all done it too, where you, you know, you, you've got the ability on your laptop to set your machine to like high performance and you want to make sure you get the best performance out of it and you're doing a bunch of work, but you don't want your machine to, you don't want the screen to kind of, to time out on you. You don't want the machine to go to sleep. And so, you know, I, I, I do this frequently and I talk to other people that do it as well, where, you know, if I'm at a conference and I'm presenting, I might be walking around and there may be nothing going on on my machine, but I'm walking around the room explaining something. And so I've put my machine, my machine in high performance and then at the end of my talk, you know, like everybody else, I just shut the screen. I wanted to just I want my machine to go to sleep. But when you're in high performance, you know, sometimes you've got it configured to where you don't want it to go to sleep when you shut the machine. And the next thing you know, your backpack is getting really hot and your machine is you know, your battery is completely dead. It's um, cooking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, the downside for that is my back is now sweating. My shirt is a little damp and my laptop has no power, but it didn't cost me anything. Same thing is true now for for Azure, you know, or for for this. So the idea is that we're going to go through and give you some sort of an assurance. And, you know, the the neat thing here or the thing that's going to be interesting is that, you know, this is just one feature that we've talked about that we've that we've really kind of that we're going to build into the product. But when we we ship and we go live with this, there's the whole idea that we have behind Curve. I guess the whole motivation is, is that, you know, we want to do a lot of automation stuff. So we have a ton of ideas on things that we want to build and put in this product and have different for different features for customers, um, things that, that, that we've, that we've seen that people need things that they have said as well, that they've given us feedback on that they want. Um, I guess what I'm most curious on is that once we get the product in customers hands and once they start using the service, I'm really curious to share with them those ideas that we have and have them look at it and say, you know, love that idea, you know, great direction to go in, but, we actually need X, Y, Z or feature that you've got about, you know, 10 things down the list. We need that right now. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I can't really, I can't promise people where this is going to go. I can promise people the first feature that's going to be in there. Yeah. Um, but, and we're just you, trying to focus on that first thing first, right? So it's when you go to curb.com and take a look at, take a look at uh, what we're talking about here. It focuses around that first feature by, by far and away it mostly focuses on that feature, right? Of just turning your virtual machines off on a schedule that you dictate. So you can say, Hey, I only, I, I don't want my machines off. I don't want my machines on after 6 PM at night and before 8 AM say, or, and on Saturdays and Sundays. So you're going to be able to dictate that schedule and then, and then, uh, and then set it up and have curb manage, um, turning those things off for you. But we're not going to be limited to that longer term. We'll start, you know, adding new things. And we've got a whole ton of ideas, uh, you know, hundreds of ideas of things we want to add to this, but we just want to solve this first problem and, and, um, 
help people manage their cloud spend by uh, by by basically being the your, your sort of guardian angel watching over your virtual machines and shutting them down when when they shouldn't be running and helping to save a few bucks. And it's actually not a few, right? It it adds up pretty quickly. So if you go up on on curb.com and go to the about page, we've got some scenarios up there that list you know, hey, if you're running this sort of virtual machine or this in this configuration and you forget five times a month to turn it off, here's what your spend is going to be. And um, and although Curb is going to cost some money per month to, to have a subscription, you know, that is going to be m- minimal in comparison to the money that you'd uh, that you'd save. So, yeah, and it's I, I would I would highlight, too, that it's unfortunate. But those items that we have on our about page that kind of show the different examples um, I would love to say they were contrived examples, but a lot of them are real world for a lot of people. Painful, so. painful personal <laughs> experiences. Yeah. <laughs> Not just us, but many customers we've talked to. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, take a look at it. We got a bunch of information up on our site. So this, the we don't want to make this too much of a pitch, but we will give you updates as we're working through the product. Um, the site is curb, K E R R B dot com. Uh, it's got, it's on Twitter as well. Curb app. It's on Facebook at facebook.com slash curb. You can get all this info from the from the curb website. Uh, and then uh, we also have a blog up there where we will share the progress as we're building out the um, uh, building out the site or building out the product. Uh, as we kind of progress, we even you know, for those of you who are interested in the whole startup space, uh, we've got a whole category on building curb where we will. Uh, kind of follow what they did with the Windows 8 stuff, where we'll explain some of the decisions we make and how we're going along with things and um, the progress we're doing. We're we're following a methodology called the Lean Startup, and it's all a bootstrap, uh, micropreneur kind of uh, startup here. So it'll be fun. So go to the site. If you're yeah. interested, you can lock yourself into the pricing that we have listed right now. Uh, if you sign up for the mailing list, which you'll find is very easy and very obvious on the site. Um Pricing may change as we, you know, build the thing out and find out that things are going to cost us a hell of a lot more than we expected them to. If, at, you know, that's a, always a case, always a, a, a risk that you have. But um, yeah, you can get locked in that way. So definitely go, definitely go take a look at it and uh, give us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you about it. Yeah, and so you know, going back to Mario's question about you know managing that pool of Azure hours and managing the spend right is the goal of curb was to assist with this exact problem that mario's uh, emailed us about or um or submitted his question about you know for companies as a developer you think well you know it's just a resource right they they'll pay for it they'll do all this sort of stuff but it's all money and companies and organizations are keen on saving money um and so it is a problem for them when developers just leave really expensive uh virtual machines running and so hopefully uh you know between um, between tools like Curb and so forth, uh, we'll be able to assist with managing that spend a little better and uh, and saving not just individuals' money but teams' money and organizations' money as well. Yeah. So, be curious. It'll be really really cool to see where it goes. So, there's a lot of stuff we haven't shared here, but again, there's a lot of info on the site, a lot of info on the blog. So, go take a look and um, love to hear from you about it. Okay, so we've we've talked a little bit about. Uh, Azure Virtual Machines and managing costs. We talked a little bit about Curb. We took some listener questions and so forth. Any sort of parting comments, AC? Uh, no, nothing. Nothing really. I, mean, I think that you know, for the big, the big thing is, I guess yes. So yeah, so some parting comments. I would have you know. Dip- no, I don't have anything to say. Actually, no, I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a podcast. I've got to have something to say, right? <laughs> totally. So you know, one thing you know, we've we've touched a lot on Azure VMs, and so I, I really think that people, especially in the SharePoint space. Uh, where we're from traditionally, where a lot of our listeners are from as well, um, I think it's a really good option of something to go take a look at. Um, the The performance is pretty is pretty darn good. Um, the flexibility, the ease, the portability of them uh, makes life a lot easier for us. I know it does for me. Um, the big thing is just want to keep in mind where the costs come from and be able to monitor those costs and uh, look at t- ways of going through and controlling those. And I guess that's the that's where we kind of come in and, and saying where we saw a need for this. And we said, you know, let's see if we can actually do something about this. And I know, you know, personally, it's, I've always wanted to do a product. I've always wanted to be in the marketing side of a product. I've always wanted to build the product and, you know, kind of build it from the ground up and, and push it out there. So I, I'm personally looking uh, forward to it as it's going to uh, satisfy a, a little hole that I've had in my person in my professional life that I've wanted to do. 
So how about you? To coin a phrase, to coin a phrase, it is super exciting. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Not right. Yeah, no, I think it's um it's it's really interesting and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it all come together. Great. Well thanks for everybody sending in questions. Um we look forward to more questions coming in from our listeners. We've also, you know, my parting comment is we've had great uptake of the podcast today. We've had some really great comments come back to people on Twitter, on email and so forth. And so that's really, really amazing to see people getting some value out of this. And uh, I hope it may continue, obviously. So we'll we'll try and keep up the cadence of these uh, podcasts. And um, but if people have you know, questions or topics they want us to discuss and tackle on the show, please send them in. We're always open to suggestions and ideas. We love to be uh, led in a direction that uh, that is interesting and valuable to you guys. So, um, yeah, I just like to say it's amazing, amazing to see uh, this thing taking flight, and uh, and I couldn't be more happy. Yeah, I completely echo that as well. And I mean, and the the other thing, I mean, I guess if we have one ask from everybody, is that if if you are enjoying the show, if you're um, you know, please go through and fill out a review. Um, you know, there's ways to do reviews based on the different ways that you're listening to it. I know iTunes has a way of doing it. It gives you know, the, the once you have reviews, you get more exposure and people can it makes it easier to find you. So, um, you know, the bigger the audience gets, the more kind of the more diverse we can get, the more questions we can tackle, the more uh, hopefully the more value that we can add people, add people, give people in this. So, uh, yeah, but just go fill out a review. We'd love to love to see what people think about it. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com forward slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a wave or MP3 and provide a link so we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is an excerpt from Evaporated Eric by Monk Turner, used under Creative Commons. You can subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find a full transcript and show notes of each episode. You can also find us on Facebook searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.